Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Psalms 32 and 33. What we see in Psalm 32 is that forgiveness is blessed. Uh, From Dr. Bill Barrick, he points out uh, this quote from James Montgomery Boyce's commentary on Psalms, that apparently Psalm 32 was St. Augustine's favorite psalm. Augustine had it inscribed on the wall next to his bed before he died in order to meditate on it better and he liked it because as he said the beginning of knowledge is to know oneself to be a sinner now we here we see that this is a masculine of david masculine could mean either a contemplative psalm a didactic psalm one that teaches or a skillful psalm and what we see is two major parts to psalm 32 verses 1 through 6 we see why believers must confess their sin in verses 7 through 11 how believers are to act after they confess their sin. So verses 1 through 6, why believers must confess their sin. We see in verses 1 and 2 that God, here's reason number 1, God covers the sins of believers. He imputes no sin to them. We find out in the New Testament that this culminates in Jesus imputing his righteousness to believers, imputing their sins upon himself, taking God's wrath so they would not. Second reason to confess sin, verses 3 and 4. God disciplines believers while they do not confess their sins. When they're not confessing their sins, he presses down upon them with spiritual and even physical affliction until they do give in and repent. Verse 5, we see the third reason. God is quick to forgive the sins of those who trust in him when they confess those sins and turn away from them. He is loving. He is is so willing to to forgive. Verse 6, the final reason given in this psalm, God will hear the prayers of the godly, those who have trusted in him who follow the Lord, no matter their circumstances, whether the circumstances are great or small, whether they're because of his people's sins or not, he will hear. So cry out and confess sin to him. Then verses 7 through 11, how are believers to act after they confess their sin? Well, First, we see verse 7, of course, confession of sin, true confession, has to include repenting from sin, turning away from sin, not just saying, yes, I admit that I sinned. There has to be a real mind change, right? Metanoia, what we see from the New Testament, that mind change, repentance. And then what happens? Well, they praise the Lord, verse 7, singing of of his ability to preserve and deliver his people. Verse 8, they trust God's word. David is quoting the Lord in verse 8. The Lord promising to instruct, teach, and counsel his people. David's quoting shows his clear trust in the word of the Lord. Verses 9 and 10, they exhort others to quit being stubborn, to submit to God, extolling the wondrous love of God which will surround those who trust in Yahweh. In verse 11, they exhort God's people to be glad, to rejoice, to shout for joy to the Lord. Then we get to Psalm 33, reasons to praise Yahweh, reasons to praise Yahweh. There's no inscription here, but most likely it is from David. In fact, it flows very well with Psalm 32. Psalm 32 ends with exhortation to rejoice in the Lord. Psalm 33 begins with such exhortation. Uh, Both Psalms we see include clear depictions of trust in the word of God, right? Psalm 32, verse 8, Psalm 33, verses 4, 6, 9, and 11. God's word is also referred to as his counsel in both Psalms, Psalm 32, 8, and 33, 11. And both Psalms speak of the vastness of God's loyal love, his loving kindness, Psalm 32, 10, and Psalm 33, 5. And what we see in in this uh, Psalm 33, if we bounce around and see these three reasons that are given to praise Yahweh, the first is praise God for his word. The psalmist, most likely David, gives the first reason for praising Yahweh, beginning in verse 4, because the word of Yahweh is upright. He then goes on in verses 6 through 9 to declare how powerful the word of God is, being that God spoke all of creation into existence. And finally, God's word is everlasting. His plans, which he has revealed in scripture, will be accomplished no matter what. The second reason to praise the Lord is, is for his actions. Praise God for his actions. The psalmist gave that second reason for praising Yahweh, also beginning in verse 4, because the works of Yahweh are so wonderful and faithful. God's works are powerful as he created the world, we see. Verse 7, his works are unassailable by those who oppose him. Verse 10, and God's works save his people, being totally trustworthy, unlike anything or anyone else, as we see in verses 16 through 19. And finally, the third reason to praise God is to praise him for his character. 
The psalmist gave that third and final reason in the psalm for praising Yahweh, beginning in verse 5. God loves righteousness and justice because, of course, he is perfectly righteous and just, and his loving kindness is vast, verses 5 and 22. God is omniscient, knowing all things, verses 13 and 14. He's omnipotent, being the help and shield of those who trust in him, verse 20. And he is holy, verse 21. So we see two main principles from these two Psalms. One, sin is, of course, rebellion against God. Therefore, unconfessed sin will result in suffering because sin has consequences. We need to praise the Lord that for the believer, the one who has been saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in the person, work, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone, the believer's consequences for sin are no longer eternal. Instead, God lovingly disciplines his children, leading them to confess their sin to him, to repent, return to a lifestyle which is more and more consistent with God's perfect righteousness. We see this in Hebrews 12, 4 through 11. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin, and you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And may we be quick to confess our sin to the Lord, to repent and to turn back to following after him. Praise him for being so forgiving. The other principle we see from these two Psalms is that God is deserving indeed of all praise. And three reasons that we can walk away with, right? His word is powerful and true. His character, his attributes are awesome and perfect. And his works are wonderful and unassailable. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, we see Paul desiring that the Christians in Philippi would be praising the Lord with their lives. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of God. May we praise and fear him, which we see from verse 8 of Psalm 33 means to stand in awe of him. Let's fear our great God, seeking to worship him with obedient lives that proclaim his glory. This has been Psalms 32 and 33, and I hope you have a great day.